Okay, I'm going to introduce Patty Keller to you all. Patty and I worked together in a previous life when I was at the University of Toledo. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce her. Patty was um, a really awesome coworker. My uh, coworker, Jennifer McKinder, is in this presentation, mostly because I always say, but Patty did it this way down at the University of Toledo. So she is going to be here to learn directly from Patty how she, how she does how she does the awesome work that she does. So she's the director of prospect research for the University of Toledo since 2010. She has her master's in education with honors from the University of Toledo, and a bachelor of science in human resource management with honors from UMass Boston. Her career includes management positions in hospitality, construction, medical residency, with her, holy cow, really? That's a lot of variation. It sure is. You found your niche. I did. Okay, good. Good. At least for now. <laughs> As a graduate student at the University of Toledo, she was introduced to a fundraising profession through her master's thesis project and successfully transitioned to a new career path. Patty's married to Tim, who is also a University of Toledo graduate. So, She's been advised to tell you two unique things about herself. So she's going to tell you about a family nickname and also how she applied prospect research to a family situation. I have to go to a meeting. I'm not leaving because I think what she's going to say is not worth staying to hear. But I've been called elsewhere. So please welcome Patty Keller. I love her home. 
uh, you know, when you think about somebody living in a home for 70 years, raising their children, watching their children move out, losing their husband, all under the same roof, and how many things have happened in 70 years, it just boggles my mind. So I would be talking to Ellen. But anyway, let's get started. I would like to know very briefly, because I don't have a lot of time and I'm liable to go over. Please, uh, raise your hand if you've ever worked with a prospect researcher. Okay. Uh, so why are you here? <coughs> Offer me some idea of what brings you here so that I can answer some questions. Yes. One of the best examples I have is that we hired a wealth engine one time, and I found that it was something that I couldn't find on my own through Google. Okay. So I, you know, and, and oftentimes the getting a bulk of names doesn't necessarily help. It's more using your existing names of that brand new person who just donated $50. Okay. And it's going about it that way rather than for me personally, using the wealth engine, getting the big list, and just having older information, frankly, just was never valuable. So I'm curious to know what's really worked for other people. Okay, so when you say you hired a wealth engine, what you mean is you had a screening done. Yes. And you got the results of the screening. Okay. Yeah. And you weren't happy with it. I had a wealth engine screening done, and I wasn't happy with it either. <laughs> okay. or want some follow-up. After I'm done, I have a card, I, I welcome phone calls, emails, whatever, um, and I'm more than happy to answer your question off, off the grid here, 
uh, if I don't get to it today. Okay, and there was one more. expanding now. We're not just research. We are identifying new prospects. We are uh, involved in qualifying the prospects and, you know, kind of giving you a basic idea of what their capacity or interest might be in terms of uh, what's, what's happening is we're developing scores uh, for infinity and for and cultivation so that we know who our best prospects and then we're also getting into this whole field of relationship management, which is an exciting expansion of the field. Um, there are many aspects and uses for prospect research, uh, including identifying categories, making lists of invitations for events. Hopefully we don't do that too often, but it is one use of the field. Um, Making connections to current donors, and that has to do with relationship mapping. Who do these people know? Who knows them? Uh, identifying potential board members from charitable interests or philanthropic um, tendencies. Why? Why do we need a prospect research? All right. This, I hope, will convince a few people. I hope after this presentation is over, that those of you who have some question about the value of a prospect researcher, why do I need that? I can Google it. I can find that information on my own. I'm hoping to convince you otherwise. A, pro a good prospect researcher will help you focus your resources. That individual will help you get down to who are your best prospects, identify them, clearly find out contact information about them, and keep their records up to date for you so that you are not constantly struggling to find somebody who will support your organization. If that is, okay, that is a basic principle. If that person that you've hired in prospect research is not doing that, they're not doing their job. Okay, that's why. Uh, deeper and more reliable information. I get it, I use Google, okay? I do use Google, I use free resources. I do not use them exclusively, nor do I trust them exclusively to give me correct information about those individuals. We should improve the efficiency of your organization. We should get you out the door more often and quicker than you would get out the door without us. Right? We should improve your strategy. We should be able to give you information that will help you identify different ways to approach people, and different people to approach, and find relationships among people who are connected that you had no idea were connected before. Of course, we should identify your life as prospects, and we should assist in determining the right ask. And what I mean by that, I'll get into more clearly later on. Okay. Who are you going to look for when you're looking these are just some general characteristics. I'm going to fly through these because it's just interesting. Curious, analytical, able to summarize events, excellent writing skills. This person needs to have discernment. If you find out something that can reflect negatively on a person, you need to be able to discern whether you should be, you know, put that in their record, reveal that to your development officer, etc. Follow the breadcrumbs, but stay on task. This kind of research can lead me everywhere. I can go someplace and find out a little piece of information and my mind will click and I'll say, oh, I can find out more about that over here. And you know, basically the path is very, very convoluted. Bottom line is I need to be able to come back to what my original intent was and I need 
need to do it purely for the people. You have to have curiosity about what makes people tick. You don't have to be the development officer that can work a crowd, because I can't do that. I'd be allowed to be a development officer. But I am very curious about what makes people tick. If somebody gives a tip, why did they give that? What motivated that? Or where do their passions <coughs> lie? These kinds of things are common between development officers and prospect researchers who have a tendency to be more comfortable in the back. But we need to be a team player and a communicator. We need to see ourselves as a member of the team and be willing to work in a team situation. And we also need to be able to work independently. I don't want somebody hanging over my shoulder every day of the week telling me what I should do. Part of the reason I love what I do is because I'm intelligent enough to figure that out for myself. And a micromanager is not a very welcome type of supervisor for a prospect researcher. Mm -hmm. You need to have imagination and creativity. You need to find a piece of information and you need to think about it for a while and follow it. Basic principles for the person in this position. A respect for confidentiality, because you are going to find information that should be kept confidential. Uh, a real commitment to accuracy. That's in writing and in what you present. If it's a fact, it's a fact. If it's a supposition, it's a supposition. If it's an inclination, it's an inclination. Identify it as such. You need to be able to discern what is relevant to the question that's been posed. You need to be accountable and honest. And if you're looking for a statement of ethics, APRA, our uh, professional conference, uh, there's all for that. And I'm giving you the link there. OK, how is prospect research done? I'm going to talk about the tools, the training, and the expectation. Tools. This is an environment that needs quiet. Okay, I have an office. I have an office door I can close. This is not a job for a cubicle. Do not hire a prospect researcher and put them in a cubicle. We need internet broadband access, email access, Printer, scanner, access to a fax. These are pretty uh, commonplace these days, but you'd be surprised at people who don't understand the needs, the basic needs. You need a central cloud system, or you need a more, uh, what shall I say, professional, uh, professional name for it would be a donor database management system, and probably most of you have that. And then you need a budget. A budget for online subscriptions because Google does not cut it. And free resources do not cut it. Not if you want what you think you want. <clears throat> there are a multitude of subscription services out there. Probably anybody who's ever worked in research knows this. But, and they're changing every single day. So you need to answer these questions before you decide which subscriptions you're going to use. And by the way, if you hire a seasoned prospect researcher, please trust them to make the decisions about your subscriptions. Every year I review my subscriptions. I'm making some changes this year to what I subscribe to. We know what we need. We know what we need. But there are multiple resources there are prior to prioritization issues, there are overlap in the services, that's true. All of that's true. Um, and you do need to take into consideration the free resources that you do have access to. My budget has been, for the last six years, $25,000 a year. That covers my subscription costs and my conference cost and whatever. And University of Toledo provides that budget for me. It is about 12% of the budget of 40 organizations to this survey. 
So where, where it falls in terms of size of budget probably relates a lot to size of staff and numbers of students. These are the subscription resources that I currently subscribe to. LexisNexis for development professionals is absolutely essential. And it is my most expensive resource. It runs between ten and eleven thousand dollars a year. But it is absolutely essential. I could do without some of the others if I had to, but I couldn't do without LexisNexis. Iway Pro and Ralph Engine, basically those are the two that overlap the most. They do have things that each other doesn't have. But they are constantly in flux and they are in constant competition with one another. So, you know, <laughs> what can I say? If they do overlap somewhat. We have to look at it more closely. G3 Donor Watch is uh, focuses solely on stock holdings, and it also updates me regularly with with uh, email updates for new um, folks out there that I might not know about. University of Toledo graduates, and it's a wonderful resource. Newsbank trolls newspapers nationwide and even into Canada and some even worldwide. And if somebody mentioned here that um, they're finding they have to pay for their searches, someone here mentioned that. Uh, Newsbank is a solution. Newsbank um, has access to all these. You do not run into that cost anymore. Um, NOSA is a charitable giving database which helps me understand where people give to and what they give and what the amounts that they give to. How much does that one cost? The NOSA. NOSA is $800 a year. So, so mm -hmm. Question? Obviously, all these fit in. resources that you will want to look for and probably will access are your public library, your free online resources like Zillow.com, Google Earth, Google, those kinds of resources are out there. Um, wealth lists from Forbes have been free up to this point. I don't know how long that will stay the case. And social networking sites, LinkedIn, Facebook. I'm not a Twitter user. I, I'm not of that generation, but I use LinkedIn every day, and I use Facebook every day. And please don't put anything on Facebook that you don't want a prospect researcher to find, because <laughs> we'll find it. <clears throat> the trend right now is that public records are increasingly difficult to access due to concerns about privacy. And this is one of the reasons that my subscription services are changing is because of limited access. So, yes. So how are you responding to that? Are, like, if you use a resource that you're afraid is going to go away, are you downloading more records? Are you having for the future, or? You know, my response to that is, you know, and it's partly because of a time element for me and a demand element for me. It's like, okay, I'm going to continue to work in the spheres that I'm able to access and able to continue with. And I can't be worried too much about tomorrow because I just, I, I could get caught in that. You know what I'm saying? So every day is new. And some, every day I face some challenges to finding, you know, information that I used to be able to find. I. I approach that through my subscription services and what I choose to use. And there's another question? Oh, I, I don't know if I see it in the public library, but I was just going to ask somebody on the software systems you mentioned before to notify you um, when your alumni pass away or they Yes, yes, yes. Actually, in my world, a lot of times uh, in, in organizations that I rub shoulders with, the prospect researcher also is involved with finding the obituaries and making sure that the records are updated. I'm fortunate that I have another individual in the organization that does that. But I do save every obituary I can get my hands on. That's awesome. That's a real Pardon me? The, the down, yes. Um, you know what? Like News, obituaries, but, you know, Newsbank has um, not 
only newspapers, but they have a separate section or a separate part that you can also subscribe to that does nothing but obituary. So I would recommend that. Oh, and we already mentioned the fact that newspapers are now charging for access. Okay, training. If you're going to hire a new prospect researcher, you're going to worry about whether they're trained well. My recommendation is that they go to the New Researcher Symposium at the AFRA International Conference. I was three years into this profession before my employer would pay for that. And three years later, I really understood why I didn't know what I didn't know. It's because I had to find a way to do this work without any adequate preparation for training, other than a mentor, which thank God for my mentor. Please. Please consider this symposium if you are going to hire a prospect researcher. There are online trainings and seminars also through AFRA. If you join AFRA, you can find online training. But there's nothing like rubbing shoulders with people in the field and, and really uh, coming to um, you know, a networking place where you can ask questions of people who have been in the field longer than you have. You have AFRA's body of knowledge, which is basically will tell you if a person is in a director of prospect research position, what should that person know? If a person is, uh, if your prospect researcher aspires to do prospect management, what skills should they have? There is that available through AFRA also. And then you have our um, Prospect L, which is an online connection that all prospect researchers have where they can pose questions and others in the field will answer or they can you know, share their knowledge. Then there's an Ohio Prospect Research Network that I have been uh, pleased to be involved with. I've been a board member for three years and that has a yearly conference in Columbus, Ohio and it's very inexpensive. So that's another option for training. Okay, salary. The most recent salary uh, information from AFRA that I could access was 2015. I think the 2016 salary survey will be out soon and will be released. Um, but here's a, here's a breakdown of who's in the field. Um, you can read these for yourselves. It's interesting to me that a director of research would be in a higher salary level than a director of research and prospect management. Mm. I don't understand that. Mm. That doesn't make any sense to me, but there it is. That gives you an idea of levels and, and, uh, and salaries. Okay, let's talk a little bit about managing expectations. These are reasonable expectations. Management should expect information that enhances strategy, not just biographical. Anybody can find out somebody's, and anybody can Google somebody and find their resume or you know their background, their career background. All you gotta do is go on LinkedIn. And you gotta ask yourself, so what? So what? How does that connect to my organization? How does that help me um, you know, pursue a gift? How does that help me um, you know, get that person involved to the point where they will want to be supportive of our institution. Or is it somebody that might look great on paper, but, and might have, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, but not have any interest at all in our organization. That's what you need prospect research for. You need somebody to be able to discern that and find that information, enhance your strategy. You need accuracy and timeliness in response to your requests. The profiles should be rich in content and the person should be able to update them when they're needed. You have a right to expect continued interest in growth and professional development. And accuracy. Now we'll talk about reasonable expectations on the side of the researcher. Your development are likely not people who enjoy field work. 
And this is this is a continual struggle between development officers and prospect researchers and database managers. Contact reports just have to be an expectation of the development officer. If they're not filing their contact reports, there's no way that somebody can go into the database and understand where that relationship is at. And that expectation has got to be supported by the upper echelon. And they have to be doing it themselves. You need the support of leadership to help you prioritize and stay on task. When I get a request from the president or the vice president, that goes to the top of my list. Sorry about your luck, guys. I've got to fulfill that before I you know, fulfill the development officer's request. And that needs to be supported by my direct um, report. Yes. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry if I had a question. <laughs> Um, gee, it's nice to get feedback. I think, you know, we work kind of in a solitary field, and it is sure nice to know when something I've done, that I've provided some research um, results in a gift, or help somebody have a really good exchange with a potential donor. Um, boy, I tell you, that's been happening more. I have a development officer come up to my office and say, you know, I just want to fill you in. I, I want to tell you about what happened with so-and-so. It makes me want to cry. Literally, it really does. I just get so excited about that. And I, I try to remember to say thank you so much for sharing that with me. Because I do have a largely solitary work experience. And it is so nice to be back. OK. The average is that a prospect researcher should support six development officers. That's average nationwide. And we really love it when we're included in planning, reviewing, and we're part of the fundraising team and we're helped to feel that way. Please provide us with ongoing training opportunities. The field is changing every day, just like everyone else's. information for corporations and foundations. I can find salaries of elected officials, salaries of governor, government and military officials, salaries of the top five officers of a company, and their stock holdings. I can find contributions to political campaigns. I can find real estate property, value of real estate property. I cannot find driver's records. I cannot find trust agreements. I cannot find your bank balance. I cannot find medical or psychiatric uh, records, names of donors, and often amounts given to other organizations are not provided. Sometimes the names, but not necessarily how much they gave. Sometimes the year they gave or the range that they gave. Uh, you know, Silver Society, Gold Society. You know, Gold Society might be $10,000 to $25,000, and that's what I can find for. Because of rules and regulations now, of course, academic records, disciplinary actions, grades, none of that's available to me. I work in a higher education institution, and they don't give me access to that for UT grads. So <coughs> tax filings I can find, court records if they've been unsealed, birth, marriage, death announcements, press releases, news stories, donor rolls from other organizations. These are all things I can find. On the right hand side, and a, a, another thing I want to mention too, if somebody's retired and they've never given a dime and we don't have any information on them and they don't have a LinkedIn record, come on guys, really? <laughs> Chances are I'll be able to find one piece of information for you. That is, if they own property and how much their property is worth. And that's it. 
And I might get lucky and find out family relationships. And I might find an old obit that will help me identify family relationships, but really, we got to catch them while they're still working, guys. you want to know what they can get. You know, you're hiring a prospect researcher and you're saying, that's the main thing I want to know. I want to know what they can give me. Don't ever ask me for net worth. Don't ask me for net worth. <laughs> net worth implies that I know not only what their wealth level is, but what their debt level is. And I don't have a clue about what anybody's debt level is. I wouldn't want you knowing what mine is, you know? So net worth is off the table. Capacity, I can give you an idea. And the idea I can give you is, what can this person of all of their wealth likely give over a period of three to five years to all organizations that they're interested in? So when I say this person has a capacity of $100,000, that means they have $100,000 they can give and if you're lucky, you're going to get all $100,000 of that. But chances are you're not going to get all $100,000 of that. So somewhere between zero and 100, and then the development officer, through conversation and interaction, can hone that down and figure out what's a fair, what's a reasonable request. Okay, so that's what capacity means. And that honestly is what I can give you.
Bitcoin fundraisers. We talked about contact reports. Why are contact reports important? We can tell me why they're important. History. History, absolutely. Institutional knowledge based on real content. Right. The person who comes there to research and go online. You know, knowledge is power. And there are people that want to keep that knowledge to themselves. But they're not doing themselves any favors and they're not doing their institution any favors. Anybody should be able to go into a constituent record and understand where that relationship was at. When you think about uh, development officers, and how often they switch, you know, I mean, the turnover is, what is it, average two years, three years for development officer to stay with the same organization. They leave that organization and every contact that they have with their prospects goes with them. You are in a world of hurt. You have got to get that stuff in the system. That's an expectation that's so, so elementary. Share what you know and be clear about what you want. You know, I, I heard the comments, you know, I don't get it fast enough. You don't get it fast enough. Hone it down. What is it exactly that you want from that research person? Don't ask them for a profile. Ask them for, I need to know what property they own. I need to know what their email address is. I need to know what their phone number or their mobile phone is. You know, I mean, get specific about what you want. And this is particularly even more important have a small research staff and a large number of people that they're serving. You've got to be specific about what you want. Yes. Yeah, if you tell your associates the turnaround time they can expect within your normal workload. Yes, and I'll get to that. Help me understand what your cause for support is. What are you trying to raise the money for? If you're in a, in a college or an organization and you have a specific project that you're looking for, make sure I understand that because that will drive my research. That will help me identify people that might be interested in supporting that particular project or building or whatever. Reasonable timelines, we're going to talk about that. Uh, discovering the epitome with your organization. If you document these things in your contact reports, that will reveal itself with time. Every, every meeting that you have face to face. Sharing your results and improving the quality of research by saying, I really appreciate that profile, Patty, but it was missing this. Or, you know, you hit the nail right on the head when you told me this. Or, next time, I'd like a little more on this. You know, I mean, we're a team. We work together. My goal is to support you as well as I can. Your goal is to get that information out of you as fast as you can. <coughs> How does management work with prospect research? Uh, there are different structures depending on the size of the organization. Um, I go to the ECRA conference yearly and I interact and network with people in my field all the time. And the structures of their organizations are very different from, from my organization. So it, it, it really is an individual thing. You need to understand that we do about the third time that's shown up, so we really need to talk about that. Uh, the non-linear structure of the work, remember I talked about the path, <laughs> following the breadcrumbs. The right reporting relationship. Uh, depending on who you have me directly reporting to is probably the person that's going to get most of my attention. Don't ask me to report to an associate vice president if that associate vice president is is also a fundraiser for a specific college, have me report to the highest I can report to so that they can kind of direct my work and help me, you know, help me decide what's most important. Give me input on my assignments and my involvement in the decision-making process depending on the work that I do. Help me prioritize any leadership roles that I need to support. And be my advocate when it comes to my budget and the resources that I'm able to access. Give me a little 
credit once in a while. Good job. I know, I, you know, we have an IT guy. He's our chief technology officer, I guess is his technical name or title. And he created for us um, a report that we get on a daily basis that tells us all gifts that come in on a daily basis that are $500 or more. And we get this in an email. And one time, he gave us a dump. I think it was about three months worth. And I went through those gifts and I found out that 85% had been touched by prospect research in one form or another. We'd either done research on them or we'd identified them to begin with. It was so thrilling. And you know, it's that kind of feedback and success uh, and, and uh, credit for, for the part that, that we play as prospect researchers that's very much appreciated. How do you, how do you evaluate this person that you hired to do this research? Okay, these are some of the things I keep track of. I'm asked to keep track of number of new prospects, we call them discovery, uh, over a period of time, those that have qualified or assigned. The concern from that is, in America, if I, if I have too many, if I have a goal that's too high, I'm going to try to meet that goal, but I'm not going to give you as complete information as I might otherwise. Uh, the number of profiles I complete over a period of time. What counts? Sometimes prospects don't pan out. Sometimes I can spend a couple hours looking at an individual and decide at the end of all that time, they're really not a prospect. But if I hadn't spent that time researching, I wouldn't know that. So it, it needs to be taken into consideration. The dollars given by profile prospects over a period of time can also be a, a kind of a metric that you use number of records that are updated over a period of time, number of relevant, relevant documents that are saved to your donor database over a period of time. All of these things are potential metrics that you can use to help you evaluate your researcher. And this is, this is just this point that I have here. Sometimes it takes a lot longer not to find data than it does to find data. You have to spend some time, and, and sometimes that time is uh, you know, not very productive. But you wouldn't know that until you got to it. Anybody ever participate in a prospect review meeting with your development officers and your prospect research staff? Okay, so, you know, it's a forum to brainstorm, uh, resolve conflicts, build internal skills, team building, strengthening. Uh, you can address proposals that are past due, discuss strategy, review assignments, discuss the outcomes of visits. Very beneficial. Okay. Levels of research in the giving cycle. What do you need to provide when you're just identifying somebody? How about somebody you've been meeting with for quite some time and you're cultivating them? How about right before you ask for the gift? I have three levels of profiles that I prepare. For identification, identification of new prospects is important for the organizational growth and health. Uh, people's philanthropic interests change with time and life experience. And then, of course, you've always got the death of your primary donors and you need to replace them. Capturing maintenance of donor information is critical for identifying. Uh, you need to be consistent in how your data is entered. Occasionally, we do screening. And we do peer screenings. Everybody familiar with what a peer screening is? People that are well known to your organization, that are donors to your organization, who do they know? Do they, you know, you come up with a list of potential new prospects, you pass them before these people. Do they know any of these people? Can they shed any insight? We do those occasionally too, but most of the time that's led by our development officers themselves. 
and then we have the analytics, the donor modeling, the data mining, and these are the areas that the subscription services that I um, that I currently use are exploring in more detail now. I'm finding that um, I don't have to have a statistics degree to do some donor mo modeling and data analytics. Okay, if you're at the stage of identification, you find a brand new person, you want to know a little bit about them, enough to get out there and meet with them. What should research provide you with? Definitely contact information, phone numbers, uh, email, address, how did I get in touch with this person? You need to give brief biographical information and you need an indication of capacity. And by that, I mean a range. Okay, up to $50,000 potential, 100 to 200,000. Nothing real specific, but tell them where in that range they would fall, potentially. When you're cultivating and you've had a relationship and you've met several times, what should research provide? Contact reports for clues, additional materials such as news articles, family background information, board involvement, personal interests. This can take about two to four hours to compile. And when you're ready to make the ask, research should be ready and willing to provide you with an in-depth profile, and this is where your time is involved, six to 12 hours for one of those. And this is why I offer three different levels, because it's a team building process. As the development officer gets out there and meets with these people, they feed information back from contact reports, and we come to the solicitation stage. Okay, I think I'm gonna skip this because this is not real relevant and I'm running out of time. I think you all probably know what a major gift donor is, and you know, the so giving donor, you've all talked about that today. happening. This is how our field is expanding. We're getting into affinity scores, uh, philanthropic tendencies, um, capacity is, is part of research, but then we're aligning the donor passions with the mission of the organization, and we're identifying where their readiness to give might be. And also, we're doing some relationship mapping, which means who knows who and who serves on what boards and that kind of thing. We're also keeping track of the moves that are made in a relationship, actions that are taken, the readiness of the, of the individual to give, the target gift amount, and potential date when you can expect that gift to come in. Uh, we're developing more getting more involved in the strategy plans of the organizations, um, developing portfolios for development officers, and identify the type of prospect you have, an annual, a major gift, a planned gift. Passing this to trends. Prospect management and prospect research, if they aren't already combined in your organization, probably will be in the future uh, because they're so, the activities are mutually supportive and we are becoming uh, more of an increased presen presence and gaining more respect in the fundraising field as being a team player and a team member. And some of the other trends are uh, big data, which is, you know, refers to um, analytics and looking more in-depth statistically at what our donors look like, what characteristics they have, um, and the skills that we are developing as researchers are um, segmentation, analytical knowledge. The best example that I can give of this is if any of you are Kroger shoppers, are any of you Kroger shoppers? Kroger, we get, yeah, Kroger food stores. We get, uh, if, if you have a card, you get a little packet of these coupons that are, and it, if you open it up, you find out that those coupons are specifically related to 
to things that you regularly buy, and the first couple times it happens, you think, oh my God, what do they know about me? They know I have a cat, you know. They know I, have, you know, they know I buy this. Yeah, that's big data. Because every time you swipe that card, they're collecting information on what you buy, and then they're designing the coupons to be uh, relevant to you so that they get you back in the store. That's the best example I can think of right off the top of that. We are also becoming more involved in data visualization and dashboards and creating them to track and update report progress on goals, uh, to make sure that that information is relevant to you. Thank you. And it's particular to your area of responsibility, and we're getting more adept at, at presenting that information visually and in charts. And the relationship mapping, who knows who, how does that happen? How does that help us in our organization? Uses of social media and scoring, this is also becoming more common in our field. I think I mentioned I use Facebook and LinkedIn all the time. <laughs> These sites I haven't gotten into much yet, but they are being used by people in my field. No, I don't. That's a new one for me. That's a new one for me. Okay, I have just a few minutes for questions. Um, you mentioned before that there's some things you may not put in a file or share with the wrong officer. Can you give an example of what that may be? Um, okay. Um, a prominent person in the community was um, involved in a uh, pickup for a drug trafficking incident, or um, someone's son was arrested because they were involved in a drug. You know. Now, if there's a news article, I will say that I saved that in the file. The file is accessed only by developmental you know, people very close to the organization, and I wouldn't put it on a profile. If I, if I created a profile and I had information like that, I would probably say, see Director of Prospect Research for further information. Anybody else? More questions? Cool. Thank you for coming. And if you do have questions that are more nitty-gritty and you want to turn, please ask.